SSR is an institute under the Department of Higher Education, Government of West Bengal. It functions as a nodal center for research, documentation of language and culture related materials, translation studies and training in cultural and linguistic interaction. IRSR frequently organizes such scholarly dialogues. Today's talk is on the topic, Transdisciplinary Approaches in Urban Conservation, a Citizen Science Response by Dr. Kaveri Korgupto. Dr. Korgupto is an ecologist by training, interested in understanding the ecological and behavioral responses of animals to the changing habitats that is either natural or human induced. Her research therefore ranges from behavioral ecology to human socio-ecology. After graduating from college in Kolkata, she went to do her masters in wildlife biology from the Wildlife Institute of India and a PhD in anthropology from Arizona State University. She started the first slender loris research program in the wild in Kalakar Mundanturai Tiger Reserve where she studied the slender loris and worked as a senior research fellow in the forests of the reserve for about a decade. Her current research draws upon her training in multiple disciplines to study the ecology of cities and other places where people live alongside wildlife. Dr. Korbukto is the founder of the Urban Slender Loris Project, a community-engaged citizen science project based in Bangalore. She also founded the Urban Waterwise Landscape Project, a transdisciplinary collaborative research project in California. She has been collaborating with multiple citizen science projects, Fresno Bird Count, Triangle Bird Count, Farm to Table Project and the Chili Project. Her most recent work has been a citizen science initiative with the Museum of Life and Science on Urban Garden Project in North Carolina. Dr. Korkupta did much of her PhD fieldwork with a toddler in tow and has been an advocate for issues that affect women in the sciences, especially involving work in remote field locations. Her broader interests are at intersection of science, environment, people and policy. She co-founded Central Barry Cafe Scientifique in Fresno, California. She does science communication for audiences from elementary school to community members using multiple platforms. She gives talks on the importance of science and people, especially women in environmental conservation in the 21st century. In an illustrious career, she has been an adjunct assistant professor in California State University in Fresno, an executive board member of Audubon, California, and an advisory board member of the Citizen Science Association. She is the principal scientist at the Urban Slender Loris Project, an interdisciplinary scientist and educator with a wide range of training and research experience in citizen science, community-based conservation, behavioral and habitat ecology, conservative biology, ecological leadership, political ecology and teaching in the USA and in India. Her main interests extend into research and communicating science to bridge the gap between scientists, policy makers and community members. Her skills are primarily in developing research, teaching, training and building communities for science education and knowledge. Dr. Korkupta served on boards for, of non-profits such as Audubon, California and is a recipient of the Toyota Together Green Leadership Fellowship. In 2019, she received the Paul Sheehan Award for her contribution to public science from the COPUS, Coalition on Public Understanding of Sciences. She has also been a founding member of the Citizen Science Association in the U.S. and has been serving in various working groups of citizen science associations in the U.S. and in India. She has been hosting a conversation series with women of the wild India. She is currently associated with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science. I now request our director, Dr. Shati Kuho, to formally greet our guest. inviting me here to give this talk. I'm really excited to give talk, I'm mean, talking to you guys, you all here. Um, but before I start, I would like to talk a little bit about my background, even though you got a really nice um, introduction. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I grew up in Calcutta. 
And in Khorda, which is some of you probably know, which is basically a suburb of the of Calcutta city. And then while I was living here, I was still interested in looking at uh, birds and plants. And partly it is because I grew up in a house where my parents' house where we had a pond and the surrounding areas had lots of trees and almost like forests. Um, it was also agricultural land. So well, I'm used to seeing a lot of birds and mammals, you know, small mammals, including jackals that used to be in my house in our house. So in that way I partly grew up in that habitat, in that area. And in my parents house but also my school and my aunt's house where I also grew up that was right next to the Ganga um, so I am I used to go as a kid I used to go to Ganga I used to see the Gangetic dolphins I used to see people catching fish I have seen people catching hill stars so a lot of these things that I saw in urban nature and that probably had influenced me to take up my subject in college is zoology and once I finished my zoology I think I was privileged enough to got to know a professor in my college in Nayati Rishi College where who Dr. Pankaj Manda who was actually interested in wildlife so he introduced me to the wildlife in um, in what is now Jharkhand area and that was during college time. Before that, I didn't really have the privilege to go and see any national park or wildlife sanctuaries. Um, I all only used to read about it. And during that time, I think I, we did not have National Geographic either. So my reading, uh, another thing that I actually got interested in forests and nature was also from my reading. I I read a uh, you know piece of I think a lot of you almost all of you have read pieces of Aranyak at some point of your life right and I think it was in seventh grade I got to um, read parts of Aranyak and that really was you know that influenced me a lot that actually probably made me think about forest this whole description of forest even though. Uh, the interesting part of Aranyak is that it was talking about destruction of the forests, right? And then I think while growing up, um, you know, when I was a little bit older in my teen years, Uttadev um, Guho, I think, influenced me a lot. Um, I used to read, you know, all the Uttadev Guho's um, novels, Madhukori, and that's how I got to know about, I think, Kanha, Tigers, and all of those things. So. Um, in a way, I think literature influenced me also to become a wild, got interested in wildlife biology and, and wildlife as such. And then when I got the opportunity in, during my master's to go and do a master's in wildlife science, uh, wildlife biology at the Wildlife Institute of India, which was in Dehradun. And um, I don't know how many of you have heard Wildlife Institute of India. It's a premier institution, but 30 Two, uh, 34 years ago, 18, 1988, it was not familiar. We didn't really know much about wildlife, um, you know, wildlife institute or wildlife as such. So I got to, I luckily, it, it was an accidental thing. I think I was part of science club and all of those, and I saw this advertisement from in one of the science club meetings, and uh, I came and talked to my professor, and he said, yes, apply. So I got to apply, and then I had to go the entrance tests and you know interviews and all to go to Dehradun and again I think I am fortunate enough to have this opportunity to do wildlife biology as a female in 35 years ago because of very strong um, mother who also loved nature uh, imagine I mean we only had seven students and a national level and it would be national level tests and only two female students they used to take at the time. So imagine going there 35 years ago to do wildlife biology, um, you know, be living in the forest. So it's not very usual, I think, to have that. And again, I, I think I'm very privileged to have that opportunity to go and do wildlife biology. 
So after doing masters, I ended up uh, going to down south. I of course also uh, at the time got married. Um, went to Arunachal Pradesh, spent some time in Arunachal Pradesh, looking at privates in Arunachal Pradesh. And during masters also, you know, nine out of two years we spent nine months living in forests. So um, I studied for my master's thesis I studied Hanuman, Hanuman Langur, which is I think all of you have seen but I actually studied them in the Himalayan foothills and then um, I went to Arunachal and did also in between did some surveys like illegal turtle markets in, in, in Calcutta which I don't know some of you probably know the turtles are illegally you know illegal in this country but it's still sold here for in several markets for meat um, and I almost got killed there because uh, somehow at one market, one of those wholesale market, we figured out that I have come as a to get information for um, you know they thought I'm coming from a government spy, as a government spy or something. So I had to run away to basically uh, you know save myself. So anyway, then I lived in South India in Tamil Nadu, and that's where I did majority of my work in uh, and um, slender lorries. And uh, Slender Loris is actually a nocturnal primate. Um, I don't know any of you heard about Slender Loris before. It's not found here. It's found in southern India and Sri Lanka. So if you look at it, this is what it looks like. You know, the previous picture is also taken by a friend who is a um, who is a National Geographic photographer, and this one is another National Geographic photographer who took this. So. You know, it looks very pretty uh, here. I don't know. I I think uh, most urban folks think of it as a, a charismatic mini fauna. So it's it's charismatic enough that people are interested. But it also has a lot of interesting history that I will tell you about a little later. So they live in um, forests, um, as you know. They are nocturnal and they are arboreal, and they are about eight inches. They are not very big. That less than 200 grams average weight, and male female there is not much of difference. I mean males can be a little bit bigger, but not significant amount that there is any kind of dimorphism. Um, so the way we used to capture, I spent a lot of time initially trying to figure out how to do this study. This was a challenge that I took up when the um, director of the park, uh, National Park, Kalakan Mundantara Tiger Reserve came and asked me if I would like to stick up a study on Slender Loris and I said yes, without thinking much. But also, you know, one of the things that I really like is I like to take challenges. And so this was, of course, much later, but I tell you initially when I wished to go out and look for lorises at night, I would go out with a torch um, or headlamp and look for lorises and for months I could not see anything. We knew that lorises are there in the park but again because they are such tiny animals they are extremely shy and only way you can see, we can spot them is by eye shine. So um, after, a, after a few months when I could not see anything, a friend of mine, Dr. Rao, late, he's late now, I mean he's passed away, let Rao Fali came and Rao said that um, he spent a lot of time there, he is much senior to us. Uh, he went out with me, he know he has seen lorises before and he showed me how to actually spot them because I was doing something wrong. thing that I was doing wrong was I was holding the torch like this or like this. Um, but that way you can't see lorises. The reason that you can't see, you have to keep the source of your light very close to your eyes so that the reflection of their eyes come to your eyes much better and that's how you spot them. So once we started doing that spotting, that kind of spotting with Rauf and I, we could not see any animal for 3-4 days and Rauf said that Kaveri give up your study, you know they are locally extinct, you don't have to do anything. But anyway I didn't give up, the thing is that what my tenacity is that I want to do, I want to figure out what's going on. So I kept on looking for lorises and finally I saw lorises as we kept the source of our light next to our eyes. And once I have that search image of finding loris, then I started seeing a lot of them. So then after a couple of years of doing this work, um, I decided I 
decided to go do PhD. And uh, the reason that I had to spend so much time because there was no studies done on lorises in the field. You know, this was the first field study. So once I did that for my PhD, I actually um, spent quite a bit of four, four seasons total to study lorises. The last part of my PhD field work, I was able to collar them, radio collar them. So the reason that you use radio telemetry is because you can actually find out where they are moving. So if you go back to this previous picture, they are capturing the animals. And the capturing these animals also is, a, is very difficult because they don't come down much and they are extremely shy. So the moment you try to disturb them, they would move away. Or they would hide under a leaf. They are small enough that they would hide under a tea cliff that you won't be able to see them. And so we figured out a way, we initially in the first season I actually put, I bought these 20 traps from US and they got stuck in the customs, I had to spend more money than the traps uh, costs and finally got the traps, put them up on the trees like this uh, in, in the canopy and nothing came. So that whole field season just gone without finding anything uh, uh, um, in the traps. Then we decided that we need to capture them by hand and put this some, I had uh, five or six radio colors that season. I tried putting them and the problem was that because they don't have a big neck, so the, the collars were falling off. And because they are, they are arboreal, you cannot put a backpack type uh, radio telemetry equipment either in their back. And they're mammals, so they do feed their babies also, right? So you cannot really attach a backpack um, with them. So then next year I came back and we here you can see the first picture we are looking for lorises you know there are five people in with me and two of them would climb I mean I was again very very lucky and privileged to have some fantastic field uh, assistants who love working in the forests and also not afraid of climbing trees or going out at night with, with us. So. Uh, they would climb trees and then I would actually stand below and we would sort of like try to you know figure out where the loris is going, follow them around and then they would climb and you can see they are wearing, some of them are wearing gloves and those gloves are actually um, really thick um, goat skin gloves uh, because otherwise they can bite you and they have sharp teeth, they are insectivorous animals, they have very very sharp teeth. So they would bite, bite, and then you know it is kind of bad. So we would climb trees. We and the person who would capture would have these gloves, and they would you know get them, hold them, and then bring them down. And here the third picture, the bottom is when we were doing radio telemetry during the daytime. And you can see one of my assistant had the telemetry equipment. I'm in the back somewhere. I mean in the back looking for some stuff. So we would go out at night to spot them as well as during the daytime we would find out where they are sleeping. So with the telemetry here you can see the male who with a telemetry collar. Um, you know we figured out to put, a, put the collar in a way that it would actually help us to, it would not fall off from the, from the animal. And in spite of that there were some animals who were not very successful, it fall off and then we had to give up. Um, but this one is again, you know, it's sort of like almost indigenous way of um, figuring out. We, um, these days, you know, you have these wear ties, the plastic wear ties you people, you put to uh, tie something. Um, 20, even 15 years ago, you could not find them here. <laughs> you have to get them from US. So got these wear ties and then I got these tubes which are heat shrink tubes. So put the heat shrink tube on on the wire tie and then mount it, <coughs> mount the radio telemetry so that you don't fall off. And that's how, you know, it's sort of like figure out a way how you do the radio coloring. So then after spending a lot of time in, <coughs> in the forest, I decided to look at urban environment. And the reason that I started looking at urban environment for two reasons, a couple few reasons. One is that I grew up in urban habitat and I always wanted to see what is happening in urban habitats and what are the you know implications of all this urban growth on the with, uh, on people 
about nature, how do they connect and what, do, what is happening. And we also need green spaces, right? So I started doing a project in the US uh, along with my you know, teaching in the university. So what I was, what, the reason that I was doing urban, urban ecology is because the, you know, if you look at the uncontrolled urban growth in, in India as well as in, in, in the US and all over, all over the world, especially in global south, the loss of green space and altered land, land cover, right? You know, you see, and these are drastic. This is, you know, today there is a, a, a patch of little green space and tomorrow you will not see them again. And it also destabilizes the urban ecosystem, right? Because of all these rapid cutting down. And there is a massive, you know, I don't even know how, how to say it, this shift in availability of food and and the habitat for, for species which are living there. I mean, forget about us. We, you know, if you are a forager, you would not find a, uh, find your the food that you were foraging yesterday. And same thing, you know, think about it. When you cut down these large trees, what happens to other animals that are dependent on these trees, you know, uh, or other species, even even insects and stuff? Um, you know, they don't. They they're losing their habitat. They're losing their tree. They're losing their home overnight, right? So that also destabilizes our climate. I mean, we all are talking about climate crisis. We all talk about, you know, every summer I hear, every time I come to Calcutta and every, I hear that people are saying that, oh, it's so hot, it's so hot, you know, it's 45 degrees. And and what I notice that, you know, it's the urban middle class people, even though they talk about it, but they have the way to get out of that heat is because they have the ability to buy multiple fans or air, these days, of course, air conditioned machines. You know, when you talk to people who are living in the margins, you know, the, the marginal communities or minority communities, those, you know, it, uh, they are the ones, the rickshawalas and the domestic workers, they talk about how difficult it is, it has become for them to live. And they always connect with cutting down trees, you know, that it's becoming hard because we don't have trees. So it's the temperature increase and it's all these sudden changes that also impact us. And it also decreases the connectivity between clean spaces that we don't have anymore, right? So here I'm going to now move to Bangalore city. That's where I've been working. Um, if you look at this urban growth, this is real rapid urbanization. I think uh, Bangalore is the fastest growing cities in Asia, probably one of the fastest growing in the world. And also this rapid changes, I mean, it is the fastest growing mega cities, definitely fastest growing mega cities in the world. It's about over 15 million people. Um, so rapid urbanization also, you can see how they're moving away from the core of the city and encroaching the land, those are used to be forests. So the challenges and opportunities of working with public, um, what I decided to do is I, you know, after living, working in the forest for so long, I, and then moving to urban areas, both in the US and here, I realized that, you know, if I am a scientist and doing working alone, nothing we can do much. I mean, we can have the thesis, we can have our data, and we can write papers, but actually making an impact in people, communicating the import, uh, importance of habitat conservation, importance of our crisis of climate, that we need to work with people. Right, we work, work with community members. So, the, there are also challenges. I, they decided to work on sit, with citizens, and we call it citizen science these days. There are different names, you know, call, somebody calls some people call it community science, some people call it public science. Uh, so, overall, the main all of this main goal is to engage citizens in participatory science work because. Lot of times, the uh, we may be compassionate about forests and wildlife and nature, but we really don't know how to actually save them. You know, so basically, understanding, making sure people understand how science works, is also another important thing about um, doing public science or citizen science. So one of the benefits, there are problems. There are problems with citizen science. There are challenges, there are opportunities, lot of these things. 
So one of the things with citizen science is that you can actually get a lot more observers than one person or two, two or three of you when working there. You also have the experimental opportunities while working, especially in urban areas with a lot of people, you can do natural and also you can do control, you know, what happens there. And the other thing is engaging community members. The big thing is that you can actually do science education, which a lot of us don't really have the opportunity, you know, especially if you are a lower middle class person or, or you know, living in the margins. And also the participatory governance that you can do, you know, the, because there are a lot of stakeholders, right? Um, so again, I'm moving back to Bangalore. If you look at urbanizations in Bangalore, uh, Bangalore used to be called a garden city, right? But what had happened in the last 20, 30 years is that garden cities now have no real garden, no real canopy space. People used to go there because our Bangalore is cool, Bangalore temperature is cooler. It's over three, the height altitude is 3,000 feet, right? And I remember even in the early 90s, we used to wear sweaters in summer in Bangalore, in the night. But over the years, that Bangalore is going through such crisis that, you know, it's, people are really getting worried. So there are different stories that were coming out for, in newspapers. And you can see here, these are little old, but this is happening much more now, you know. Uh, it becoming it's almost like it's unlivable right now the pollution the uh, crisis of um, you know even um, uh, communications and Bangalore also has no real I mean there they have lots of water bodies but they don't have drainage system because the like here uh, you know you guys are probably seeing every day how these whole areas you know drainage is being covered with big tree, uh, big homes, I mean, right now, all the urban development. Um, and there are a lot of work, I think that a lot more work is happening in Bangalore in terms of conservations and city, urban conservations. And one of the persons, Dr. Harini Nagendra, she's been working a lot with her students and herself on Bangalore. She actually came up with a book, Nature in the Cities, and she talks about, uh, she, you know, she does a lot of archival research and ecological research. So she talks about the past, present, and future of a Bangalore city. So here is one thing I want to show you guys this picture here. So if you Bangalore was started in 19, uh, sorry, 1537. So if you look at 1537, the center, if you think of 1537 is the center, which is now currently around Lalbagh area. And look at the growth now. And this is only 2007. Of course, now and the, at two, around 2007, it was 741 square kilometers. So it was like 37 square kilometers in 1537, and now it's actually over 750 square kilometers. And look at what is happening in the city, the pressure, and the pressure is also coming from outside people. It's not like here where, you know, people, most of us are from Bengal or from growing up in Calcutta, grew up in Calcutta. But here the pressure is coming also from outside, outside India, oh, sorry, outside, of course, outside India too, but mainly from outside Bangalore or outside the Karnataka state. And if you look at the greeneries, I mean, this is what it looks like. And this is the last one is in 2020. The vegetation structure, you know, vegetation in 2006 was 20. 29%, it has gone down to 14%. That's 2020's prediction, but it actually has gone down much more right now. Right now, it's actually less than 10% in Bangalore city. So here is a picture that's taken by another uh, friend of ours who uh, is a wildlife photographer. So uh, in 2013, we were, all of us who were working in urban areas in Bangalore, we actually got together and decided to work on something that would, uh, especially with people, that would actually uh, get some attention of people for conservation of urban habitats. And uh, since I work on slender laris, we realized that there is slender laris actually available in Bangalore city which we didn't know earlier, you know, I've been going to Bangalore from 1990s and we had no idea. In 2011, actually, some friends of mine came and told me that there are uh, lorises in, uh, up in 
in an institute of science campus that you know you should come and study there but anyway 2013 we did this meeting and we decided that you know we should use the slender loris as a sort of like a um, flagship species to look at urban habitats so the reason that i also started doing um, um, public science or citizen science is because bangalore people love lorises you know they think it's really cute and it's like icon of bangalore and you know a lot of attention it was getting so i said okay you know this is great for for me to do a public science project so um you know i did not talk to scientists when i came in 2013 i actually sat and talked to people who are interested in slender loris and i started in the indian institute of science campus because lot of the graduate students and postdocs and scholars there they they are the one who are keeping track of slender lorises and so i conducted a online survey uh, and figured out how many people are actually going out at night to see lorises regularly who keeps track of lorises who has seen before you know before coming to um, isc campus or who has not seen or don't know anything about lorises and look like that there's like almost 60% people uh, who are living on campus they know about lorises and some of them go out and look for lorises at night some of them even rescue lorises and they're not necessarily from you know ecological science background even though there is center for ecological sciences where their main work is ecological work so 2014 i again came back and i started talking to public as well as various other organizations who are interested in urban conservation and if you look at here you know indian institute of science gupi lab stf is a non profit dakshin is a non profit eco edu is a for profit organization and the last one is koshis koshis actually is a restaurant if you have gone to bangalore koshis is like our coffee house it's an iconic restaurant there and all the intellectuals go there and co I'll tell you the Koshi story a little later. So, when we were doing this project, the way we set it up, the first thing is that we needed to figure out who are the ones who are interested, right? And then, what are the extent of historical change that happened in the city in terms of the structure, in terms of the forest cover, and in terms of people's perception, right? Identified, we identified the key habitats. we needed we needed to identify the key habitats we also needed to do look at archives so historical records we also needed to do some outreach awareness and capital uh, capacity building these are the ones that we thought that we needed to do in order to look at um lorises and the uh, extent of urban habitat destruction so it is it has to be a multidisciplinary project here uh, it's too small but this is what a um, mental map or mind map that i had created um so basically looking at you know here is one side is <coughs> all the habitat and what we need to do in terms of looking for lorises and the other side is actually what we should do when <coughs> with people and and uh, and the developers development urban development that's happening so anyway so what we started doing i said that we started an online survey we actually increase the um, i mean increase the audience or participants of the online survey we actually put it out for for everybody in bangalore to see so this online survey through that some newspapers got hold of me and they started like uh, times of india deccan deccan health no what is it called deccan health deccan chronicle deccan health both and and some of these hindu also so all of this big including some of the newspaper uh, local newspapers the kannada media kannada uh, newspapers also picked up the story and through that we got lot of particip lot of interest in lot of uh, participating in this kind of project so then we start once we found number of people we started doing the selection and that selection um, and the training so once you do this selection of people then you need to train them because they are not scientists right they are all people from all different parts of world parts of life they came together because they wanted to 
look for lorises and they're interested in habitat conservation. So once we, I trained them, you know, I got a bunch of people who are like our core team members. Then we started doing diurnal surveys during the daytime looking for loris habitat. So I also had to train them not only just at night how to look for lorises but also looking for habitats. Right, what are the possible suitable habitats, possible habitats where lorises can be, uh, including uh, like, you know, tree identifications and habitat measurements, a lot of those things we had to do. And then after choosing the areas, and the city was actually divided into five by five square kilometer grids, and each of these grids you look for green spaces, and then we look for what are the possible sites that lorises can be there. So that's the diurnal survey part. Once we chose the sites, then we started doing nocturnal surveys. And the nocturnal surveys are done by the trained um, citizen scientists. And then they started training them, training others too, right? So then we also did tree identification training. And then of course we had a lot of the outreach program that we did. So these are actually on top of the metro a uh, line on an MG road, I was actually doing, you know, uh, working with the community members, our core team here, uh, figuring out how to uh, do more, you know, uh, the project how, um, and how to go about meeting more people, talking to people, planning, all the planning part. And here you can see, you know, during, people are coming here from far away to just to go look for lorises or finding lorises and also look for you know, conservation of habitat. And there are a couple of scientists also sitting with me here. Um, I also started taking people out in ISC campus uh, looking for lorises. An interesting part is that, you know, this gentleman here in the front with pink shirt, he he's a scientist, he's a biostatistician. He grew up in, in and, and a naturalist. He grew up in, in an institute of science, camp, science campus and he has never seen a loris. He's a birder. He has never seen a loris. He has never seen a loris in Bangalore, in ISC campus either. So that's an interesting, you know, thing that even if you live in city, even if you live in, in within the habitats of slender loris, you may not see them because they are nocturnal. And if this person is a naturalist too, so even if you are a naturalist, you may not be able to see lorises because of they are so tiny, they are so difficult to see them. This is actually the ice cream parlor. This uh, person who owned the ice cream parlor. He told me that you know you can do meeting anytime you want. So that's what we used to do. And here I gave a talk in Koshi's. Um, if you remember Koshi's um, restaurant. So this is actually Mr. Prem Koshi. He told me when he heard about me doing Loris project, looking for Lorises. So he said, oh, you know, I'll give you all the support. So he used to provide us the space. He used to actually, he spent, he gave quite a bit of money to do outreach work. Um, here, one of the advantage of doing urban ecology um, is that you can actually work, uh, and citizen science, is that you can work with the uh, kids too, right? Of course, you have to have parents who would let your kids, let their kids come and... Did everybody hear this sound? What is it? Huh? Slenderlaris call. That's a that's a call that they do give in order to communicate. One thing about Loris biology, which is very interesting, Loris is a primate, so they're like us. And you know why why do they call primate? Why we are called primate? One of the characteristics, a couple of the characteristics that all primate has. Anybody know? No. Apes, humans, they are bipedal. Any idea? What is this? Opposable thumb. Everybody has thumb. I mean, a lot of primary thumb, mammals have thumbs. Opposable thumb. Okay. And forward facing eyes. If you think of all primates have forward facing eyes, there are some exceptions like. You know, owls have forward facing eyes too, but those are exceptions. But if you see that in all primates, forward facing eyes. And they, they are forage, they forage at night, but they are solitary forager, which means they uh, move around alone. And they communicate by calls like this. 
and these calls are not always you know you cannot hear them all the time it's not continuous occasionally you would hear them so it's very difficult to record you know this is probably one of the two records that we have got or uh, in the wild that we were able to i mean i used to put i used to put um, tape recorders under the um, lorises where they are uh, sleeping and yet i never put it this is this call was from iisc campus so that's the advantage of having kids that we can have kids these are actually these two in the front the yellow band and the pink one is my kids the other one is another wildlife biologist kids but those that's a uh, community member kid so um interesting part is the, the left side picture here that's what actually you go when you go out at night you just see sometimes these two tiny little lights and that's how you can see lorises those are actually loris spotting that we were doing and uh, i was telling you guys that we did tree identification this is dr navendu page he is probably the best wildlife uh, that you know botanist in the in india right now and so he was helping me in the project so he would do this uh, training for identification and because these are during the daytime again kids would come and you can see that there's lots of interest in uh, wanting to know learn about um, you know wildlife and ecology in urban areas where they are living so that's that's a really interesting part of bangalore so um, i also did a survey and uh, this is actually uh, through interviews so a few of our team members used to go out in areas where uh, the looking at community members so they would go to temples they would go to markets they would look for people who i uh, would ask questions random people to see who have seen lorises and who have not seen lorises here the people the concerned individuals and the those those are actually interested in wildlife they are worried about ecology or uh, you know what's happening with, with nature and stuff and those are traditional individuals means they are actually random people who could be villagers who could be you know um, urban folks so not interested in wildlife or don't know much about wildlife so if you look at 6 out of 60 people and 78 out of 165 people have seen lorises so it's not a huge number you know even the concerned individuals but not a whole lot have seen lorises although it's almost like 50% but traditional individuals they're not a whole lot right so then uh, this is in koshi's restaurant the mr koshi is right there in the bottom and these are two friends one of them is actually a journalist with ndtv Uh, the other one is a businessman they they grew up in bangalore and then when i started talking to them i was doing a oral history project too talking to them about lorises um this is what
So it's like, you know, uh, pest control, right? Organic pest control kind of thing. So, and he also said lots of stories. And he was talking about this Maneksha Park. If you have been to Bangalore city, you know this is actually in the middle of the city. Near MG Road, this is at, right now, it's a, um, yeah, I think it's controlled by army. Uh, this big patch of forests. So, so you know, if you, so when we did the survey, this is from our nocturnal survey. This is also information from interviewing people who have seen lorises and also people who are rescued. There are a lot of wildlife rescuers in Bangalore city and they get called to rescue lorises in, in the city. So if you look at, so the presence of lorises are again in small patches, right? But past, we got the, the uh, sorry, triangles are past, uh, in, you know, um, records and they are uh, much more spread out than the, than of course what it is now. But the thing is that also it's, um, we could not get much information from the other parts of the cities because the, you know, um, problems of working in cities is quite a bit. So, because the government, the city government, the municipal corporation did not give us permission. Or even the horticulture people did not want us to go out at night in Lalbagh or Kappan Park. Even though we have done a couple of surveys in Kappan Park and we have seen lorises there. Right? So, the challenges, these are the challenges of working in cities because you have multiple stakeholders, you have to get permissions. Uh, palace, uh, Bangalore Palace people did not give me permission at all, you know, because they have seven stakeholders there and none of them could agree. Uh, some of them would agree, some of them won't agree. But there are lorises in, in Palace. I would get information from them. So this is, I don't want to go in detail into it. So we did surveys in institutional campuses, in forest parches and in public park. So of course institutional campuses, Bangalore has lots of institutions. And most of the institu institutional campuses have forest covers and you have seen, we see lorises there. Here, just to give you some examples of what we used to see ISC campus, you know, like all of these institutional campuses, we have seen lorises, some of these forest parks, some of these par city parks, which actually supposed to have lorises or people have seen in the past, they, uh, we haven't seen them. And in fact, I have heard stories about lorises falling off the when they were cutting down trees from metro in Bangalore, lorries would fall off from trees in JP Nagar and Jainagar areas. Um, here is another sad example that I'll give you. Um, this is a city park. This is called Nagawara Park. It's, a, it's owned by the forest department. This, is, this used to be outskirt of the city. In 2015, by 2015, it's part of the city and the developers are developing. And so these 30 acres of land, the developers for force the forest department to make it a city park. And you know what we mean by city park. It has to have these, you know, paths, running paths, walking paths. It has to have these trees that are big, but most of them should be exotic. And anyway, it's a lot of these things. This is the part where we actually have seen a breeding population of slender lorries. During our survey 2015-2016 and also we did a diurnal survey where we have seen lots of other animals too. 2000, uh, the interesting history of the park is also, it used to be part of a lake. So in 2000, they didn't really have much. When, you know, you can see a little tiny bit of water there. That water is still there in 2005, but when it got acquired by the forest department, they started letting it go like this. So this is like part of restoration of habitats, the what they were doing. 2014, it was pretty good forest cover. And 2015-16, we started seeing them, you know, loris, seeing lorises along with other animals there. But it's gone now. The other problem with city with lorises are there are some um, things about black magic, bad omen. You know they are like like what we do. We Bengalis don't like to watch. We don't like to find a hutum pacha, right? They think it's it's um, um, it's not good. It's bad. Uh, but they like loki pacha. Um, so like that, uh, you know, lorises are very grey big eyes, very lanky, it's not really 
they don't look good. In fact, when I was doing my work in Munantara in Tamil Nadu, they used to say that, why are you working on Flindaloids? Isn't there any other animal that you can work? And also, like, they would say that if some kids are very thin or very, um, you know, lanky and they have big eyes, they would say, oh, well, um, Flindaloid is like eyes you have. Like, they call it Tevangu in Tamil, and Tevangu Madri Karnerike, which means that you have slenderized like eyes. So, um, so there is also all of these things going on with lorises. But lorises are actually protected by the Indian Wildlife Act. It's actually an endangered species by Indian Wildlife Act. I'll talk a little bit about another study that we did. This is oral history study done by a student of mine um, who was doing her master's work. And she surveyed 185 people over eight weeks in, in the summer of 2017, this data collected. And she found some interesting, because our goal was to figure out whether there is, how many people, what the perception of people about lorises, is, whether people really hate them, they don't like, because we know the urban middle class people love them, right? So what's happening otherwise? So she interviewed, um, you know, here you can see 59 percent people, they said they are aware of lorises, the other 40 percent said they don't know. Uh, when you were looking at, in, you know, in presentation citing substantial lorises among people, there are people who have seen lorises within the past five years, but they've seen lorises, you know, above five, I mean, more than five years ago. So you can see that there are variations in that also, right? Seen in natural settings, seen in non-natural settings. So non-natural settings have gone up much more, right? In when they saw it beyond five years, because people used to catch them at that time. When looking at people's perception, she found that there are some there are positive um, things. And there are some people who are neutral, and there are some people who uh, believe in uh, lorises as a negative thing. Superstitions, some they say that loris, so that loris call that you heard, people don't like that. They think it's lorises cry, and that's not good to hear. Okay, because it's a very loud call, call right? And it's like booth in, in some ways. They call it also pay in Tamil Nadu. So that means, you know, being bad for misfortune, bad luck and stuff like that. And there are people who are completely neutral. They don't think anything about lorises. They don't have much cultural connection. But there are people who also have, there is a group of people who actually still uh, worship uh, water, I mean lakes and forests. They're living in the middle of the city. Um, and those people think of lorises as good luck. And then there are this tribal group called Haki Pikis who believed in, you know, that lorises can cure diseases and stuff like that. So I'll talk about um, outreach stuff that we actually did for this project. You know, it's a lot of work. I mean, I when I went to do this, set up this project, I actually told my kids that I'm going for six to eight weeks. I ended up staying here for six months just to make sure that the project can run. Okay, so we did Loris walks. We still do Loris walks in ISC campus. Uh, we do. We do have. We used to have newsletters. We just stopped it recently. We do lots of presentations and talks in Bangalore, in India, as well as in the U.S. and in international meetings. And like here, I'm talking about Loris project. Um, we also use social media quite a bit. And we had lots of posters all over the city. That's again funded by Mr. Prem Koshi. We would talk to citizens. You know, we would just randomly go and have meetings. You know, through um, in in restaurants, in in uh, schools, uh, everywhere, pretty much. Then we also had lots of uh, talk sh radio shows. You know, interviews, blog posts. Um, Science cafes. I don't know whether you know about science cafes. Is that this is a movement that started in UK. It's called Cafe Scientific or Science Cafe, where actually you go and talk about scientific research in public in a cafe, sitting in a cafe or restaurant. And we did that for 10 years in California, in Fresno. So we had a lot of science cafe talks there. And we have blog posts, we have newspaper articles, we have scientific papers, publications. 
and so this takes a lot of time and a lot of work which I did not think. You know, in fact, if I was working in the forest, I would not have to worry about all of these things, right? I would just work by myself. Only thing I have to do is get permission from the forest department and do the work. Here, there are, because there are multiple stakeholders, things take a lot more time and you have to make sure that people understand what you are doing because some people, there are some people who are very compassionate about wildlife and conservation. They think that stuff, if you study them, then you are actually, people are going to know about lorises and then they are going to be, people are going to kill them, people are going to go and disturb their habitats and stuff like that. So there was a lot of, you know, um, hindrance that I had to, a lot of hoops that I had to jump even in the wildlife community or naturalist community. So this is an old uh, map though, old, uh, sorry, graph, um, but I still show it because, um, you know, if you look at, we had this core group who actually used to run the surveys and manage the work. Uh, they still do, some of it is. And then we had the social media, we had online survey and we have interest uh, groups which are like, you know, Google group, that group or through Facebook also. Um, and we were able to reach, even now, I mean, I think we probably reached over, you know, 20, 30,000 people in Bangalore City and internationally also through our talks and you know um, presentations in scientific community as well as in public talks and i was telling you about articles that came out in newspapers um, i counted i recently published a paper so for that i had to count how many publications newspaper publications we have so far i think it was about 50 or 55 um, so it's a, it's a lot of articles, a lot of interests. Um, the newsletters that we used to publish, we stopped it recently because we don't have the resources right now. People got busy. And these are all done by community members without any money. They're all volunteers. All they're interested in wildlife conservation. Um, we also started looking at connection between uh, wildlife, sorry, between lorises and the, uh, commun the traditional communities with their, um, you know, hebbas, uh, their, their Bangalore has a lot of these uh, things where they would go to a temple and they would do worships and they would have get-togethers get like melas and mala, Bangla is a camera of mala, we share of them, So we are trying to, we are trying to connect with people, you know, wanting to know their stories. So been using storytelling methods for schools and other places, these kind of places about, you know, connecting them with lorries and nature. So here is, again, you know, this is, of course, I was talking in a, in a restaurant. Actually, this doesn't exist anymore. But this is to be owned by a um, by a uh, person by a uh, lady who is now um, uh, I think she she is now a MLA uh, of Bangalore um, I think from one of the Bangalore centers she is the Congress MLA but she is actually very much interested in conservation and wildlife so she she helped me also with the research actually getting permissions and stuff. Um, here is a picture of, um, we do lorry swaps as I was telling you, we still continue to do it. These are all community members, they came to look for lorises with me, with us, our team, uh, in the ISC campus. And you can see these are people coming from far away at night just to see lorises. And here I want to show you guys what we see. By the way, this is with a 600 millimeter lens. This is what most of the time you would see. Trying to catch an insect and eat. So this is a friend of ours did it while we were doing the survey in ISC campus. It takes a village to study a city. And literally, it does take a village to study a city. Um, you know, without the help of people, we wouldn't be able to do it. And thank you.
to all of you for listening for so long. Um, if you have any questions, please ask me now. And thank you for inviting me to. Thank you, ma'am. That was a really interesting talk. It was, you know, the, the PD work and everything, it was like a fresh wave to us, if I'm not wrong. I think everybody will agree with me on this. Uh, and also it was scary at times, it, you know, the places where you're talking about the, um, the greenery, like the vegetation land uh, decreasing year by year and also the um, where the uh, lorises are killed for um, uh, black magic, mm -hmm. that was like too painful. I mean, I mean, I was reading the news article and it was horrible, just like unimaginable actually. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we should open the panel for questions if anybody has any questions.